let's talk about Maria specifically um, then, because um, again, you know, I, I just I find her such a fascinating lens, and I'm I'm not a middle child, but I for some reason like I I, I relate to the the kid mm. who are sort of in the middle <laughs> of the family. Um, right. She's sort of the uh, the oddball in a certain kind of way. Um, she's sort of the mm. you know sort of marches mm. to the beat of her own drum. Um, but tell me your 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 brief sort of um, biography of what we should know about about her, her short life. I think yes, she she especially in her younger days, she probably did feel I mean uh, sort of not quite fitting in. That the older sisters even called her their step stepsister <laughs> at one stage, mm. and this is you know, I mean, they're still fairly young, but you know Olga and Tatiana were, you know were made a one pair, and then. Anastasia was very close to her brother Alexei, and so she did kind of feel left out, in, you know, in her youth, in her childhood, and she would even write notes to her mother about it, and and her mother would reply, "Let me say, we we all love you as much as all the others," and you know, it's and as she grew older, I think that she sort of grew into herself. She was one of those very caring kinds of people. Um, she loved children. There's that wonderful footage of the family when they've gone to Romania in 1914 and you know, they're sitting on the deck of the Standart and after the photograph has been taken off she rushes to to pick up the the baby Romanian prince that her older sister Olga is, is holding on her knee you know she loved children she said she wanted to have lots and lots of children and marry a soldier with you know, if things had taken the actual course that would have probably been of course impossible but you know she she had a lot of a caring nature and affectionate nature. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she, yep. she was endearing in the sense that she was also a little bit awkward. Like she wasn't as graceful mm. as, as her um, two older sisters. Um, and Asia was, was the same way. She was a little awkward. Maria tended to sometimes fall at like official occasions, like stumble and fall and, and, uh, and, you know, get very embarrassed. So she's, she was very relatable and endearing in that sense. And also um, they, uh, when, when she was a, uh, 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 small child uh, she was so good that they used to uh, call her that they used to refer to her like as an angel because she never did anything wrong and at one point she did something naughty and and her father said something like wow you know I'm glad that that happened because uh, you know I was looking for the wings to sprout or something like that she's normal she's a normal child after all so she was a very um, a very very good child and she always wanted to be good she, she when she wrote these letters to her mother she would uh, uh she would say like oh you know i really i I'm, i'll be good i, I want to be good and and she, she was just really fixated on, on being good maybe it had to do with her insecurity about being a, a middle child and and maybe she felt like um you know she wasn't the eldest she wasn't a boy she wasn't the youngest or she felt like maybe uh, she wasn't loved as much, but of course, as uh, as uh, George mentioned, her mother always reassured her and uh, um, said that, you know, of course we love you uh, as much as the others, and of course that was true. Uh, they didn't uh, they didn't play favorites. And it's interesting you mentioning her awkwardness. There's one very famous occasion from it was January 1917, and Prince Carol of Romania had come over on an official visit, and um, it was a Festive, you know, a festive evening, dinner, and, and, and down comes Maria down the stairs into the room where everyone is and trips on herself and stumbles down the <laughs> stairs a bit and, um, and you know, says, oh, bat Marie. And um, it's, it's something that, you know, it's, it's normal everyday sort of behavior kind of a thing. And um, actually Prince Carol want, wanted to ask the Tsar if he could marry Maria. But, you know, she was still basically still a school student at the time and the Tsar said no. She's still too young for that. <laughs> yeah, I guess Prince Carol liked that about her, that she was a little bit awkward and very human. Yeah. Mm. And she was very pretty. She was, uh, you know, she, she, was, she was a beautiful, beautiful child and a beautiful young woman. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, the, the, the years that you cover in, um, in the book, which is 10 years, I think, right between, um, 08 and 18. Um, so when, between when she's nine years old and 19 years old, um, there seems to be two really fascinating things to me about, um, 
the that span one obviously it's very formative for any person um that's a that's a tumultuous 10 years in a person's life um obviously but but you know set that against the backdrop of what's going on around her <laughs> during that time which is an awful lot um um quite obviously um did did you sort of did you see or did you get a new um uh, vantage point into the the bigger broader history by by kind of focusing on those years and like seeing it through this kind of first person perspective i mean for me yeah for me personally I mean, you definitely see um i mean from all the sisters uh, when you look at it from their, through their eyes you definitely see um a different point of view but in different ways each sister i think contributed uh, her own uh, point of view and her own um, information. Um, Maria wasn't um, as good as um, Olga and Tatiana um, uh, in the keeping uh, diary records, but she was great at writing letters. And uh, she um, she contributed a lot more on sort of like the personal anecdotes and uh, uh, parts of their personal lives. Um, whereas, uh, say, Tatiana would uh, describe a lot of uh, events that were external events and even political events. And, and, and so did Olga. And Olga was kind of a mixture, I think, of, of the two. But uh, Maria's letters are, are just wonderful. If, if you just saw her um, diary and her writing, it, it, it got a little, um, she, she did, you could tell she didn't like writing in her diary. She found it tedious and, and she was sort of like ah, you know I just have to get it done but her letters were just amazing I mean you really got the sense of um, who she was who, who who her other family members were the things that they did and um, even uh, if, if they were uh, kind of like personal private things that the family did they also related to um, uh, you know, external things and, and their duties as, uh, let's say, um, they, when they um, worked, uh, at, uh, they, they would visit uh, soldiers at the, at the hospital during the war at the infirmary. And, uh, you know, of course, some of them ended up dying and they would actually visit their graves later on and they would bring flowers and they would um, uh, sometimes like talk to their families and and uh, so they were very caring um, on that level it wasn't just like we're the grand duchesses and these, these are our duties they got very much involved with um, with uh, with the people and and uh, especially uh, the soldiers who who they cared for and and they called them their our sol soldiers our our patients our wounded so things like that, mm. definitely. Yeah. And I think um, also, I mean, that, that time period, especially as she's getting into her late teens, you, you really see her come into her own. At the time of the revolution, her older sisters and younger siblings were all very sick with the measles, and she was the only one really on her feet at the time. And you know, she went out with her mother in the, you know, in the cold, dark night and you know, sort of asked the, the, the guard at the, at the palace if, if they can be assured of their, you know, protecting them. And later on in Tobolsk, when they separated the Tsar and Tsaritsa, uh, you know, at, to take them away, and everyone was assuming to Moscow, but um, it turned out to be Ekaterinburg in the end. But, you know, the parents decided to take one of the daughters. And I think it's sort of the, during that time when everyone else was sick, Maria showed how strong and steadfast a personality she had and you know, how reliable, how much, you know, they could, you know, put their you know trust in her and that would be one of the reasons why they took Maria along with them t on that journey to you know, destination unknown as far as they were concerned they didn't know where they were going and what was going to happen and because she was such a reliable kind of a person they would have decided I guess that she would be the one who they, they will have with them during this time of uncertainty because she'd shown before that she had the the strength of character in in a difficult situation to to manage and keep a cool head. Hmm. Yes, absolutely. And even once they were in uh, Ekaterinburg, um, and once they knew what what was going on, and they uh, saw the situation was pretty bleak, uh, Maria used to write a lot of letters to her sisters uh, back in Tobolsk, and uh, you know she would kind of describe. Um, 
the situation, uh, the, the house, the, the, how they were treated, but then she was still like very optimistic. She would say, well, you know, uh, the sun is still shining, the birds are singing and, and, you know, things will be okay. So she was, she was realistic and yet she was still optimistic. And I guess it po possibly just to make, uh, her sisters feel better that, that, that they're doing okay. But she, yeah. um, she, you know, she, she was like, you could really see that, she was uh what kind of a person she was uh once yeah. they were in that situation mm. yeah so she had that optimism but you know she also mentioned that you know we have not so nice surprises every day so she, she let them mm. know that it was not going to be like it was before and to you know to prepare themselves for quite a different regime over there but you know but there's still good things to find you know in life yeah, so she had that sense of optimism i do find it fascinating to you know i i i think i, I like most um people my age read diary of Anne frank when i was in when i was in middle school um and you know i i always think back to that and the the um the value of sort of seeing a teenager's optimism in in the midst of this horrific um catastrophe mm. and and, right. and you know that voice of 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 innocence and optimism from someone who you know, for very very different reasons and, and, and in very very different ways but were the victims of history um having done nothing wrong and, and you know met a uh an, an early end but but still have this sense of you know i still believe in the goodness of people right? <laughs> um and, and that you see that right. Right. um and it's a really uh pretty invaluable thing to to be able to um yeah. still have access to absolutely i mean uh, maria actually loved um uh, living in tobolsk um mm. she 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 said it many times in her letters where she was like oh it was so you know it was so i'm paraphrasing but but it was you know life was so wonderful in tobolsk it was peaceful uh, we took walks we we sat out um on the porch we yeah she she loved it i, I think she enjoyed it more than she did living in the palace in a way yeah yeah, yeah. She loved interacting with the guards, and she just loved her life there. And and a few times she mentioned in her letters uh, from Ekaterinburg, like how I miss a life in Tobolsk. So she was, um, she was a, a kind of a very happy teenager, and and she had a lot of hopes, I guess, for for her for 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 the future, which makes it even more sad mm -hmm. uh, for her. Mm -hmm. But uh, but that's um, I, I guess uh, it was it was her personality, it was her age. But uh, but but that was very different from say her sister Olga, who who fell into a depression and and she wasn't doing well, and and the age difference wasn't that great between them. Uh, but uh, you know it was it was uh, definitely there was an aspect of their personalities that made them different in their outlook. Yeah, I mean, Maria could be described as much more happy-go-lucky, and um, I think mm -hmm. Olga felt things a lot more, and you know, sort of maybe could read read the tension in the air maybe a, a lot better. But nevertheless, I still think that you know, they, they will have all felt you know that it, you know, things were not going to be terribly good for mm -hmm. them, but right. definitely Maria had that still that that sense of optimism that kept her going. I think, yeah. Right, right, and and she was an artist, and and uh, when they took away their cameras, um, she was the one who um, liked to uh, k kind of instead of taking a picture, she would uh, um, draw sketch things. Uh, like for example, she uh, there's a famous sketch uh, she made of Rasputin's house <laughs> when on their way from Tobolsk uh, from Tobolsk to Ekaterinburg, they stopped over in uh, his village. Um, to change the horses and and it was happened to be right in front of his house and she made a sketch of of Rasputin's house uh, for uh, posterity I mean uh, uh, that's uh, um, you know that's something and, and and she was the family photographer so she was very artsy and um, she uh, liked to I guess document things and the way she described uh, the party of house in Ekaterinburg I mean that was uh, uh, something where where you saw that she was she was kind of like she was definitely an artist uh, so she was sensitive in that sense uh, but uh, her optimism I think didn't allow her to fall into uh, depression for too long um, the way 
the way Olga did, and I think the way Tatiana did too. Um, so, you know, that made her sort of stand out among the, the, the siblings. One of the um, few really famous stories about Maria um, is one that the two of you both refute as as having happened. And that's the idea that when they were living in the um, House of Special Purpose, that she was having a romantic tryst with uh, one of the guards. Mm -hmm. um, two mm -hmm. things. Uh, where does that story come from? And, and why do you both think that it's probably nonsense? We <laughs> <laughs> uh, start with the cake. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> Okay, the um, the cake story. Um, I wouldn't want to say it didn't happen, but the major source for someone bringing in some cakes on her birthday came from one of the um, killers, Yermakov, and he was doing an interview with an American journalist. I think it was in the nineteen thirties, and he was, oh, I'm dying, and I want to tell my story, and he spun a whole pile of fanciful nonsense, and um. And as far as I know, that's the only source which said uh, uh, on you know, Maria's birthday, one of the guards brought in some cakes kind of thing. And, and so that's where that part came from. So there may be some truth in it. Uh, you know, maybe not. Yeah, the way the way that that things were at that house was was that the guards weren't even allowed to look at them or, or, or speak to them, let alone bring them cakes. Yeah. I mean, uh, they, the, the, the rules were that if you, if you do, if you break those rules, you, you basically got, not only did you get dismissed, but you, you, you may have gone to, to jail for, for, you know, several weeks or whatever. It was, it was pretty strict in that house. Yeah. So I can't imagine they weren't allowed to even make eye contact with them. Even if they spoke to them, they got in trouble. So, yeah. um, it, I can't not imagine that, that, a, that a guard would, would get cakes mm. somewhere and bring it. I can't just imagine that they knew the diff they knew the difference between, among the sisters a lot of them got them confused they didn't know which one was which just based on their descriptions of of uh you know uh, of, of the way they looked and mm -hmm. um i i don't know how they would have known that it's her birthday and it just sounds so um unrealistic that uh and especially the story coming from um, from Yermakov, who who was not reliable mm -hmm. at all, he got a lot of things wrong. Um, it's just not something that I would uh, that I would even. Um, I mean, maybe if there was a, a corroboration from somebody else, or it just doesn't sound um, realistic. It doesn't sound doesn't ring. Uh, everything we know about what went on in that house. Um, it, it just would be completely inconsistent with, with reality. It would be very difficult to, to, to pull off. Very difficult. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, maybe the cook made some cakes. I don't know. But yeah, the yeah, idea of There might have been some cakes there, but I don't yeah. think it had anything to do with the guard, right. let alone, um, you know, a, a guard that, that, that had a romantic interest right. in her. I mean, I'm not saying that, 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 they, they wouldn't have thought that, oh, you know, these girls are pretty or whatever. That's not, you know, but I seriously doubt there was any um, any even casual interaction. Exactly. And then um, the, it had been said that um, one of the deacons had said that, you know, sort of we have to give a, a pass to an imperial soul kind of a thing, which when we looked at the actual evidence of what the deacon had written and said, it turned out to be something quite different altogether. And what it had been was that uh, the commandant Urovsky had told them basically, you know, you're, you're not allowed to talk to the prisoners. And the deacon said, well, this is what's happened before and we're not such important people, but, you know, you can basically, you know, we're not going to have any interaction with them, basically. Mm -hmm. and. Yeah, that's basically what it was was about. Service, uh, do the service and leave, and don't interact with them other yeah. than uh, just the necessary, um, you know, logistics of the service, um, and that's yeah. all it was. And somehow it ended up uh, being translated as uh, something implying something else completely, and uh, you know that's sh and and that's what the whole premise of of uh, um, Maria's. Um, uh, you know, Maria, Maria's sinful behavior, or however you 
want to call it. Uh, that's where that came from. And and basically, when you when you sort of dissect it and you look at it, uh, it, it it was nothing. It was based on nothing. So and we we talk about it um, in in some detail in the book, and we explain why why we feel that. Well, it's not even why we feel like we we give facts, and 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 I guess the reader can just. Uh, uh, decide for themselves what they think, but uh, but th- there's really no base. There was no basis to it whatsoever. 